Here at Copper State in Casa Grande, Arizona, about an hour south of Phoenix, we've gone out and flown the Evolution Trikes Revo. I've long considered this and still believe it to be one of the most deluxe trikes on the market. And that's saying something. There's some other very nice trikes from some other producers, most of them out of the country. This one's an all made in the USA aircraft. It's got an Austrian Rotax engine on it. But other than that, I think just about every part on it is made in the USA. Well, except for the MGL Avionics, they come from South Africa, and we like those as well. So, a handsome product. Let's talk a little bit about the human factors of the aircraft. I'm sitting in the front seat now, the aft seat. It's a tandem configuration. The aft seat is significantly higher than the front one. I'm going to reach around and point at the headrest up here so you can see. The rear seat occupant, whether that's the instructor, we'll come back to that in a second, or just someone you're taking for a ride has great visibility over my head as we're flying and yet we are both protected by this windscreen that we see here. I'm kind of mo motioning my hands around it because it's so clear you can't really see what it all is and these little winglets out here are very much a part of it that's not any mistake or anything. It's a deliberate effort to create what they call kind of a bubble of, of not high speed air moving past you. So if you lean out to the side or put your hand out to the side, you're going to notice you're zinging right along in this aircraft. It flies quickly as our flight report showed to you. You can watch that part for those numbers and so forth. But this windscreen is a big part of it. The seats are they are very, really very comfortable. Uh, they've got nice backrest to them. Um, I'm kind of picky about seats and I didn't even notice these while I was flying and that's a good thing. But do they adjust for an occupant? Well, the one way they adjust is by the rudder pedals. These are set just about right for me and they're very comfortable. When I flew, I'm going to move my foot down there so you can see the Revo pedal with the name on it. When I put my feet back up on them, I'm going to go down to the low end of it first. Now, the reason why I would do that is for steering. One of the complaints that some people make about trikes is indeed something you do need to get used to. That's called wrong way steering. There's been some efforts in the past to make it right way steering, but really, after a, after a short while, you'll have it down, and it's really very easy. It's very controllable in steering. You just have to remember which way you're going. Think of riding a bicycle. The left side of the handlebar goes forward and turn to the right. A trike steers the same way. It's not that hard to get used to. The left side pedal is the brake, which also has a parking brake feature to it, which uh, like many light sport aircraft uses a uh, hydraulic valve, push the pedal down, set the valve and the brake is set, undo the valve and the brake is released again. But when the right side pedal is the throttle, like your car. So the right side foot pedal overrides the hand throttle, which is right back here where I've got my hand now. And and that this is positioned here for the aft seat occupant if he happens to be the instructor. Foot throttle is in the right place then to free your hands up. Now you'll notice that there's another um, foot pedal here. That is for the aft seat occupant. And both of them, I'm going to move the pedals a little bit on my end and you'll see this one moves right with it. So that's moving the steering wheel back and forth so that the, both the instructor and the first front seat pilot can do that. Speaking of the instructor, that's what explains this U-shaped bar that we see right here, which is firmly attached to the control bar. You don't have to have that. That's for someone to give demo flights from the rear or to do instruction, which this aircraft has been used for. This allows, if this control bar was back about here, which is where it would normally be, that would move this part back about here, which is an easy reach for the uh, aft seat instructor. So he can control a great deal back there. He can help you steer, he can uh, turn the engine off, he can move the throttle, and he can completely control the aircraft in the air using those. This is the discovery unit from MGL Avionics. It's not on right now, but it's got the typical display. It's very nice, loaded with information, very easily read. 
And uh, if sunlight was a factor, I didn't even notice it. So I'm guessing not too much. They are also using a Garmin. I believe this is a 696, or you could use the touchscreen 796. And the device right here uh, in, in front of my hand is the uh, GDL39. That brings in both weather and traffic to them and displays it on this screen. So when they're flying long distances, they can get uh, all the information they need while they're flying. Then there's an array of switches here in what might be called the T-Panel. And there's a bunch of important ones here. First of all, these four right here have to do with starting the engine. These are two fuel switches and the lane A, lane B lights that go with the Rotax 912 IS fuel injected engine. Uh, then the engine uh, start. And the way to do this is to push this button down. I'm not going to do any of these things while we sit here. First, you'd lock the brake in the parking brake position, then you pull down, that's the start, and then you push this button while holding that down, and that's what starts the aircraft. Typical Rotax starts right just up like that, like they all do. So that's the main controls. When you come back in and you want to stop, all four switches off. The one's right under my fingertips here. Shut the fuel off or shut the AB lights off, um, and, and that's the control. This controls the electronic circuitry for the 912 IS fuel-injected engine. And then master switch here basically just fires up the electrics for everything, and the master switch goes off last. So a couple more things. I reached back earlier and operated the throttle. You could do that one if you wanted. That's mainly for the aft seat occupant, though. There's another throttle right over here between my fingers, and uh, that's the one the front seat pilot can use. And again, you use the foot throttle during takeoff and landing operations so your hands are both on the control bar. And typically, you get your hands way out here at the edge. That gives you what they call a triangulation effect. And uh, the controls are actually surprisingly light for a heavy high performance strike like this is. So throttle here, over on the left side here, if our camera can see it, uh, just by my hand, right in front of my fingers, is, a, is the radio. Okay, as we bring the camera back, then we see the BRS parachute handle here. Uh, it's easily reached by either occupant. They can reach down here and grab it. You see where it ejects right here. There's a lap belt system right down here. There is also a recoil system built in right here, and you see that it it recoils back in on its own. By the way, while I'm out here, this uh, black stripe that you see here, this is actually the main Kevlar strap, which is not yellow like you usually see because they've got it in a sheath, which protects the important part, the Kevlar inside, from sun degradation. But this is very typical of all this aircraft. There's hardly a detail left out. And indeed, they have a joggle built right into the mold here. So as my hand rubs back and forth on that, that bridle is not sticking out at all. It's buried down in all the way up here. And you see as it goes up here and then it goes to the back. The reason for that is you want that to come all the way around on the top of the aircraft and bring this aircraft down just about like my hand is. The nose wheel would probably touch first and then it would hit on the rear wheels. No parachute landing is soft, but given the wonderful suspension on this aircraft and the sturdiness of its construction, uh, you'd be very happy to land under a canopy if that was what you needed during flight. This is the uh, fuel-injected Rotax 912 IS engine. This is the one that gets such wonderful fuel economy uh, and provides all the power that this aircraft needs. As you heard in flight, it does make good use of the 100-horsepower engine that they've installed here. Again, just another detail, the beautiful color coding they've done on this, what they call the bumblebee uh, paint job here. They've got some beautiful paint jobs, and whenever they do that, they make the coordination of the cowling over the engine, and the valve covers look just like that. In addition to the engine that, that performs so well, they've got a Sensenic prop here on the back, and the one we have on this aircraft is being replaced as uh, uh, it's in final development now. Sensenic has made a custom prop just for the Revo, because as you see, it's a pusher, of course, so there's some wind blockage here. Larry referred to it as a shadow, and they've optimized the shape of the propeller, and it's going to be a little bit longer than this one, a couple inches longer, uh, and that will give it some very impressive performance. Currently, the ground roll, this is not a fast takeoff machine. This is a fast travel machine, so it doesn't jump off the ground. It's about 8 to 10 seconds of ground roll. They are going to cut off two and a half seconds of that by a different prop. So that's 25% improvement in prop thrust on the ground. And they believe that at full uh, gross weight 
on a standard day, that's a 59 degree temper, standard atmospheric day, uh, they'll see better than a thousand feet per minute. And if you were solo, it's going to be more than 14, 1500 feet per minute. So this aircraft really gets up and going after that little bit of ground roll. This aircraft has not only pitch trim, but roll trim. So let's come down here and look at the wheel pan. You notice it's quite an elaborate wheel pan here. And first of all, why is it shaped that way with this big fin on it? There's a reason why this fin is here and not someplace else on the trike, and that's because you've got a certain amount of fuselage that's ahead of the center of gravity. So by putting these fins back here, you help increase its stability very much. Think of it as twin tails, if you will. Uh, they don't have to be huge surfaces. These are pretty large, but this is more than enough to do the job. But what's really interesting is this movable surface back here that you can see where my hand is trying to show you. And this is an electrically driven system. There's one on the other side as well. They were very effective. The aircraft also has pitch trim, and you use them both. And you heard that on the video that we shot while flying. But let's bring in the designer, the main man behind the Revo trike and the new Rev single-seater trike. His name is Larry Mendick, and we want to ask him a question about the pitch trim. Uh, Larry, I'm going to hand you the mic, and please tell me how the mechanism up there does the magic that it does in flight, please. All righty. Well, basically, back in the good old days when uh, there was no such thing as electric in-flight uh, trim, we could reposition the carriage on the wing, either fore or aft, um, and set up the wing to fly at a certain speed range. Of course, you were either stuck in fast flight the whole time, uh, or stuck in slow flight and of course uh, you want to be able to change that during flight. So what we've devised is it's an electric uh, linear actuator that pulls two cables going into our CNC hang block and you're going to see this hang block start to move forward on the wing when I press the fast button down. So here I go and there it goes and you can see we're slowly we have four inches of range there so this thing's going to keep going 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 and it has a limit switch it just stopped and that's where it stops and so this is trimmed for a hundred miles per hour and then if we go to slow this is going to pull back the uh into the slow position and so we're literally changing the cg uh just like you would uh if you did it manually on the ground what I like about this system is that the pitch that you're feeling is coming from the natural pitch stability of the wing itself based on moving the CG. And some of the other systems that are out there, bungee cords and so forth, uh, you don't really quite get a natural sense of pitch uh, because you're basically spring loading the wing in some cases. This is the simplest and uh, the most effective that I've found. So Evolution Trikes formed in 2009 when the first Revo was introduced. And since that time, uh, they say, and I've observed a whole series of changes that just continue to add to the sophistication of the aircraft. It's, it's quite impressive now. It was very good at the first iteration, but it's just been an, an unceasing effort to continually improve the aircraft. And, and not only the carriage that we're looking at that's so beautifully done, but there's been coordination on the wing too, which is a very important part of it. Many trike makers, or not all, but most trike makers are just using somebody else's wing. Nothing wrong with that on a simpler, uh, less performing aircraft, but if you want to get into the performance range that Revo achieves, you've got to make the whole package work right together. And they've done very, very expertly at that. You can buy this aircraft as a special light sport aircraft that is ready to fly, turnkey, get some instruction, of course, they're gonna to see to that before they allow you to take it away. Uh, and some is generally uh, required, certainly for a fixed-wing aircraft, but even for another trike pilot, there's some things to learn about Revo. Uh, factory can help you with that. You can get the aircraft also in an ELSA or experimental or kit version. That won't save you a lot of money, but it will allow you to do your own maintenance on it. Now, of course, if you do pick the ELSA, you cannot do flight instruction in it, but for many buyers, that's not their objective anyway. In the Special Light Sport aircraft, the SLSA version, you can do flight instruction, you can do rentals in the aircraft, uh, if that was uh, your goal. Uh, and if you load it up with everything in the world on it, all the stuff you saw on this one here, you can push past six figures in the aircraft. If that's out of your budget, well, lucky you, the company has recently introduced the REV without the O on the end, and that aircraft will allow you, there's a version of it that can meet Part 103, a simple, very low cost, well under $20,000. So if $80,000 or so or whatever you spend on a Revo is too much, you got another choice. 
There's versions of that as well, and you can uh, bump the price up a bit. It still won't go too high, but it depends on what you want. So the company, Evolution Trikes, now based in uh, Zephyr Hills, Florida, has really got a wide range of options for you. They've got about 70 machines flying today, and I'm sure that number is going to keep going up. So if all of this uh, flying around in the uh, Bumblebee Revo that we flew today, and I'm going to get a chance in another one with an uh, even more improved wing because this company just never stops. Uh, if you're interested in buying one, uh, you can contact the company through their website. That's evolutiontrikes.com. Current delivery, there is Revos in stock right now. We're talking uh, about the end of the year, 2015. That could change, so contact the company. If you want one that's custom designed just the way you want it, they're talking about 12 weeks. So that's not very long, even for those that need to come that way to you. I hope you'll check it out. And for lots more affordable aviation from Revo Trike to anything else you want in the light end of aviation, check it out at bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for joining us out here at Copper State in Casa Grande, Arizona.